Okay, so let's get started with chapter six. What we're talking about now is designing the modules. So we've looked at requirements, we've looked at planning, we've looked at budgeting. Now we're getting into actually designing the software. How do we do that as a software engineer? Um, uh, but the, another thing I want you to do though before we, I should tell you this, uh, in module seven under content, I think I sent an email out on this. I found a YouTube from a guy that I think he works for Google, but he is uh, a software engineer, and he's explaining what he does as a software engineer. Now, the guy before him, I actually found another guy out there who said he was a software engineer, and I started looking at his YouTube. He was a programmer for one of the big gaming companies. So the world beyond academia uses software engineer to mean a higher grade programming or what we're doing, project engineering. Okay? So the YouTube that I chose was one that's closer to what we're doing here in project engineering, overseeing the team. Okay. So let's take a look at designing the modules. So this is what's in chapter six. Um, and we're going to try to get through um, probably about 6.5, 6.6, somewhere in there tonight with a lot of slides taken out. And uh, we'll see how it goes. I want to leave a little time at the end for you to get together as your project team as well. In fact, you're taking notes. John, can you watch time mm -hmm. for me? Um, at 7.30, okay, can you let me know? Okay, so here are the objectives of, cha of chapter six. Design principles, what is the designing? What is it we're doing during designing? Uh, what about object-oriented design heuristics? And we are gonna talk about that, but not all the slides. Different design patterns, exceptions and exception handling and documentation designs. Those last two we probably will not talk about. So, what about design methodology and refactoring? Remember what refactoring does is when you've got everything scattered all over, you try to condense it, right? So, con refactoring and condensing is maybe uh, a good way of saying it. So, uh, periodically, during the process, this is later after you've finished your project, but periodically you are going to come back and revisit your design. Just like we talked about revisiting requirements. All the processes here, the whole project needs to be constantly alive. We don't say, oh, we've done that, done, go forward, right? Uh, and a lot of that is to simplify complicated solutions or optimize the design. Sometimes we get farther into the project and something that was rather complicated suddenly seems a lot clearer to us as we start working with it. And you'll see that in your own project, right? And we find better ways to do things and we want to optimize the design. So design principles are guidelines for decomposing the system's required functionality. So we take the requirements and we're now going to organize those into design steps for designing the software. Um, we're going to talk about, when you talk about modules, this idea of hiding data or hiding things is very interesting. It doesn't mean that we're trying to do something we shouldn't do. What we're talking about is there are some things about what we're doing inside a module that does not have to be seen by the module that's feeding it nor the modules that we are feeding, right? And in fact, we may have a schema for data that maybe we're doing it in strings or maybe we're doing it differently. And we write our module that way. And, but we write our interfaces so that we talk to or talk from the modules feeding us and talk to those we're going to. Why do we do that? Because that module then can be something we use in a future project. And all we have to do is change the interfaces. Okay? That's what they mean by hiding. 
I had to do some research on that because I didn't know what they were talking about. Is that a term that you've heard? Okay. Um, so, the, the dominant uh, principles are the modularity, which is something that we all should be thinking of today. No more top to bottom, everything in one program. Uh, interfaces, the information hiding concept, incremental development, we've talked about that. We've talked about maybe developing a product that we can see how it works and maybe the customers can even start using it because of time restraints. And we come back later and we do more. Abstraction and generality, those are methods. So, modularity. It's the principle of keeping separate various unrelated aspects of a system so that each aspect can be studied in isolation. For instance, one of the ones that I was thinking about because I lived through the Y2K world. Anybody know what Y2K is? Y2K was in the 19, uh, 19th century, no, 20th century, 1900s. <laughs> yeah. In the 1900s, we only used two digit dates because 58 was 1958, and everybody knew that. And 1992 was 1992. And if you wanted to know how long something had been going on, you could take 92 and subtract 58, and that's how many years something had been happening, right? Somebody woke up at mid-1990s and said, wait a minute, when we hit 2000, that ain't going to work anymore. Because we can't have 00, zero and zero, 01 and subtract 92 from 1 and get a negative number, and that's not how many years, right? So people panicked. So we've got all that software out there looking at two-digit years, and we've got to change all of it to look at four-digit years, right? Well, in COBOL, Fortran, RPG, it doesn't matter what language you were using in the old days, it was hard-coded in every program. We had a concept of subroutines, but subroutines were still hard-coded in every program. So that this was a matter of reading every program and looking for this problem and fixing it, but also fixing all the interfaces to other programs, so now it transferred four digits. That moved the field requirements over in the records. A lot of, it was a big mess, although it didn't turn out to be as big a mess as people thought it was going to be. Yeah, everything shattered. Yeah, everybody <laughs> thought it was the end of the world. Yep. So anyway, but that's one of the concepts. In today's world, Maybe dates would be a good module, module, module within a program. Everything that deals with dates, run it through this module. Because when you're uh, programmed by modules, you can call another module to embed itself in your module. Right? But it doesn't stay there. If you modify it over there, it goes modified and comes in. Okay? So, modularity is the principle we're working on. Um, So, to do it right, a, sing a module should have a single purpose, rel relatively independent of the others. That way it's easier to maintain. When there's a problem, you say, well, what module does that? Boom, you go to that module. Right? And in today's world, it doesn't take a lot of performance time to have a lot of modules. They're easier to understand and develop, easier to locate faults, like I was talking about. Easier to change the system like Y2K problems. Um, so we have some terms in here called coupling and cohesion. And it measures the independence of modules. Coupling has to do with uh, one or more, uh, two or more modules. Cohesion has to do with in inside one module. So let's talk about that. We say two modules are tightly coupled when they depend a great deal on each other. So if you have two modules, one module can't do anything without the other. They're called tightly coupled. They're loosely coupled when they have some, some dependence, but their interconnections are weak. Okay? You could have 
a module that depends on the date function, right? So it's tightly coupled with the date function. But the date function might be loosely coupled to the database search module. Okay? So it doesn't have to be, it's just between two modules. Um, and uncoupled are modules that have nothing to do with each other. So when you look here, here's a tightly coupled set of modules, right? Lots of things are happening between them. Here are some that are kind of loosely coupled, meaning one, one function is going across here, one's here and one's coming back. And here are some that have nothing in common. So that's all that coupling really means. So content coupling. So we couple in different ways. Uh, content coupling uh, occurs when one component modifies the internal data of another. So if you're changing the content of another module, that's really what it is. It's content coupling. Okay? Common coupling. There can be common data that's used across the system. So maybe we have some global data and some variables, uh, but we set a value in one of our modules for that common data. But we want it to travel for this particular run of the application into the other modules. Does that make sense? Okay. So if we're modifying common data, which is common to the application, but now we're setting a value to it and running it through other modules, sharing it with other modules. Control coupling. We can actually change how a module operates from another module. So we may send a control character or a control string through to another module and it actually operates differently. Right? And many of us have this one uh, when you go into a website that wants you to join and it asks for your password, your ID and password, but it also gives you another option that you, you're a new user, so you're going to set it up. That's, an op that's kind of an example of that, right? It's going to pass you to another module, say, new customer. So that's a control module, control coupling. Stamp and data coupling. Um, when you pass a whole data structure from one module to another, that's stamp coupling. When all you're doing is changing some data or passing data from one module to another, that's called data coupling. Now, cohesion. Cohesion is within a module. So what we were talking about before was passing between modules. Now we're talking about within a module. It refers to dependence within and among modules' internal elements. So we're going to talk about these terms here. So, Coincidental is the worst degree. It's parts of the internal are unrelated to one another. Uh, logical is when parts are related only by their logic structure or code. Temporal is modules, data, and functions related because they're used at the same time in an execution. Temporal meaning time. And procedural, similar temporal, functions pertain to some related action or purpose. And the reason it's, it's uh, related to this is because these are both going to happen once and may change for the next time we go through. Okay. So, communication operates on the same data set. So, within a module, Part of cohesion is communication, which is uh, dealing with the same data set. 
functional cohesion is the ideal degree. All elements essential to a single function are contained in one module, and all the elements are essential to the performance of the function. So two things. Everything that needs to happen is in one module, and everything that it needs is there. Okay? And then informational adaption of functional cohesion to data abstraction and object-based design. So it's the taking of this here and applying it to a different paradigm, object-oriented. Okay, so we also have interfaces, and um, maybe it'd be better if we were to do this. Is this the way I picture it? If you're talking about a module, and within the module, you've got the code and the data and the procedures, whatever you've got going on in that module. Then you've got an interface going out, and you may have an interface coming in. Okay? So that's what we're kind of talking about. Um, so an interface defines what services the software unit provides to the rest of the system what's going out, and how other units can access those services, what's coming in. Um, so for instance, a object in, is the collection of the object's public operations and the operation signature. So when you have public information, it's information that's in the interface that other modules can see, and it has a signature which describes that data, the name of the data, uh, string data, whether it's integer, whatever, all the descriptors. Um, the interface must also define what the unit requires in terms of services or assumptions for it to work correctly. This is what is flexible about these kinds of things. If we look at an interface, if we use modularity, by the way, in the Y2K world, this is where we would have fixed it. Because we still could have dealt with two-year dates if we had a method for changing the values over here. Maybe you subtract 50 from every year. And temporarily, that would get you, oh, get you an answer for 50 more years, wouldn't it? Because okay. then you'd add 50 over here and convert it. Just an idea. Um, there are a lot of, by the way, there are a lot of problems around this still today because of all the legacy systems out there. So people still worry about this kind of stuff. There may be systems that haven't used in a long time. Uh, software unit's interface describes what the unit requires of its environment as well as what it provides to its environment. In other words, what it requires over here and what it provides over here. All of that is in the interface. So you look at something like this. This could be the module. This could be interface A and this is interface B. Notice that the interface A may be different than interface B, depending on uh, what module it's talking to, for instance. It may use a different interface. Or we might have an interface for all the new modules we're building today, which we're using data in a much more flexible system, but we're still interfacing to all the old legacy systems as well, so we have a second interface for that. And I think we talked about this in one of our discussions in one of the other slide sets but talking about the fact that um, the module itself can be operational without worrying about how the data looks going in and coming out. That's also the concept of hidden data versus public data. Or 
information hiding. Here it is. So, each software unit encapsulates a separate design decision that could be changed in the future. Okay, we've talked about that. Then the interfaces and the interface specifications are used to describe each software unit in terms of its externally visible properties. But what about the internal properties? Well, they don't need to be seen by all the other modules when you do it this way. And we call that hiding. It doesn't mean that we're keeping it secret from anybody. But the flexibility of it is when we want to reuse a module in some other piece of software, maybe all we need to do is change the interfaces. Okay. So a module that hides a data representation may be informationally cohesive. A module that hides an algorithm may be functionally cohesive. Remember, cohesion means the modules work better together. And the big advantage is the resulting software units are loosely coupled, meaning that it's easy to change them. They're not as dependent on each other. So is it better to have the loosely coupled? It's better to have loosely coupled in the sense of um, ease of modifications. Yeah. So in that sense, that's what they're talking about here. Yes. If they're too tightly coupled, then eventually it begins to look like the old legacy code. Right? Possible to change. that design now, a modular system with interfaces, we can now devise a schedule that sets up incremental development. Okay? Because we can decide which modules in our, it's kind of like Legos, which Legos we need to make a system that will start us off, take care of the customer. Or, remember we talked about uh, slack time and all the different things to get to guide our goals. You can also decide which modules to build to get to your goals before you go to the next level. Uh, we talk about uses relations and we'll see that in our UML graphs a little bit. Uh, relates each software unit to the other software units on which it depends. Use graphs can help to identify progressively larger subsets of our system that we can implement and test incrementally. So without going any further, let's look at a few. I think these are going to come right up. Yeah. So here are two types of use graphs, uses graphs. Uh, fan in refers to the number of units that are that uh, use a particular software unit. So for instance, um, this may be the unit, and this then shows how many other units use it. Okay. Fan out refers to the number of units used by a particular software unit. So maybe in this case, A uses these, C uses G. Okay. Now, this is more like this, if this is the fan out, fan in, I'm sorry. Uh, this would be the number of units that use a particular software unit. So this would be where we are going out to other units, right? I don't like the word in and out the way they've used it. But if I read that right, fan in refers to the number of units that use a particular software unit. So they're the ones we're going to talk to. Wouldn't it be the number, be the number of units that are making a call to that function? Yeah. So yeah. would that be going in? Well, if you're going to call is that there, function, there, you're going to want the output from it, aren't you? You're going to want the output, but you're calling in and you're passing in. So maybe that's where they're yeah. using their term, yes. I think so. So yeah, you're, you're going to be you're going to be actually activating the module to do something. Right. And then you're going to get the data back. Right. Okay, good. I like that way of looking at it because it confused me. Yeah. We were both looking at the same thing, but it just didn't seem right. Yeah, so if you look at fan in, that's the number of 
units that are going to call this module or send a request to this module of some sort. And fan out then would be the number of modules that this module is going to activate and ask for information. Does that still make sense? Yes, it's what's called. Let's get this on units. Yes. Huds. Yeah, I'll tell you those are huds. Those are huds. <laughs> <hunts. laughs> okay. Those are close, low, loosely coupled units. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Now, what about sandwiching? This is kind of interesting. Um, if you have three modules that work together like this, B feeds A, which feeds C, which feeds back to B. Okay? Well, one way you may want to make that a little simpler to see, you're still going to have B, but in your uh, diagrams, you may want to look at B1, which is the... Uh, Initial stage. It's the operation plus what's sending out, right? to A, which feeds to C, which then feeds to B2. But then A and C, we can break those up too, can't we? B1 feeds A1, and maybe A2 then feeds C, and C feeds B2, and maybe we can break up C also. So when you're looking at drawing a diagram for all of this, depending on how complicated it's getting, sandwiching may help you see which way it's going. But that's just the use graph itself. So let's suppose that there's a system function that is sorting the elements of a list. The initial description of the design is sort L in non-decreasing order. What's non-decreasing? Yeah, increasing. I don't know why they put non-decreasing, but anyway. The next level of abstraction may be a particular algorithm. So maybe we're taking a particular algorithm, and this is sometimes where pseudocode comes in. You don't have to actually put it in the language you're talking. But do it with something they can read. So the algorithm provides a great deal of additional information. However, it can be made even more detailed. And I may have skipped this one. No, there it is. Okay, so you can add even more to it. Okay. So, let's look at design principles. Generality is the design principle that makes the software unit as universally applicable as possible to increase the chance that it will be useful in some future system. So we've talked about that. When you're building those modules, don't try to make it very specific to this particular application. If you can, if you're going to build a module that accesses the database, one way you can by the way, help things is maybe the module is the only thing that really understands what the database looks like. In that way, you can send all kinds of requests into the module not knowing what the database looks like. Another way of looking at that is that's a security level. Somebody comes in from outside, does not get that module, but gets your database, they may not be able to make anything out of it. Or your module talks to an interface, so you can talk to multiple kinds of databases. Yes, exactly. Uh, sort of the way API works these days. Like what? <coughs> API. Mm -hmm. So instead of giving you know somebody access to the database, they'll give you an API key and you just pair with it to get information out of the database. Exactly. Exactly. And that way you can only run the queries we let you run. See all these good ideas that come up that they've already done. So anyway. <coughs> Um, what that does, though, is it allows us to make uh, very generalized modules that talk to other modules that have the specifics in them. Um, it allows us to then use that module in future applications because it's more general. So there are several ways of doing this. Parametizing context, specific information, which is kind of what we're talking about in the database. Removing preconditions and simplifying postconditions. So let's look at what that means. Can you go 
close the back door. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So this this is talking about uh, taking a procedure and writing it in order of increasing generality. In the first one, we have a procedure called sum. It's integer. Its post condition is it returns a sum of three global variables. So there's only it's going to add up three numbers to give us the sum, right? Um, in the second one, we have procedure sum a, b, and c. They're integer and they return the sums of the parameters, A, B, and C. Well, we get even more general. What if we had an array called A, it's integer, its length is integer, it's going to be fed in, and it's, it's based on integer. So the precondition is that zero is less than or equal to the length of the array, which is less than or equal to the size of the array, A. Um, the post condition is it returns the sum of the elements uh, one through the length in array A. Pretty general now, isn't it? Now for four, five, ten, a hundred elements, it looks like that would work. Or we could say, well, let's say a procedure A, which is a, an array, it's integer, it returns the sum of the elements in array A. That's very general. Okay. Does that make sense? So as you uh, simplify your preconditions and your postconditions, you move more and more to a generalized approach. This, if this were a module, which it isn't, but this can do a lot more than that first one could. That first one's only good for three values. This one's good for any number of values. can read what's up there. This actually uh, comes out of Wikipedia. I added this slide just because she never defines UML. UML is Unified Modeling Language, and it's used as a tool for us to see designs as we're designing our system. And uh, it's a general purpose developmental modeling language in the field of software engineering that is intended to provide a standard way to visualize the design of the system. So when we use it, and some of those block drawings we saw before are versions of UML. But as we start designing our system using UML, other software engineers that understand UML will understand what we're doing. That's the whole purpose. So it becomes uh, a necessary part of your documentation. And it's also popular for describing object-oriented solutions. Um, you can use visualize, specify, or document a software design. Um, and that really says enough of it. It's really, it's really a tool that we're going to use. So we're going to see some examples of it. Here's where UML is used in use case diagrams, which we just saw a couple of them. Activity diagrams, which I think you have that in your project, don't you? To do some case, some activity diagrams. A domain diagram, component diagrams, deployment diagrams, all the rest of them. So here's an example of UML being used. Is this, uh, no, they're not going to tell us what it is. There's, there's an application we're going to see in a minute. But you can see where, um, actually, it's how UML is used, actually. UML component diagrams, UML deployment diagrams, class diagrams, sequence diagrams, and so forth. This is in the requirements area, this is in the architecture area, and then in the design area.
Okay, so we're going to take a look at an application called the Royal Service Station Requirements. Um, so they provide three types of services. The system must talk bills, the product and services. Uh, it's to set up to control inventory. It's to track credit history and payments overdue and so forth. So this is the requirements set here. So, if we do some UML class diagrams to describe the object types and their static relationships, we're going to define what's in the inventory, what's in the, uh, what's due, payables, uh, accounts receivable, whatever it may be. And we're going to depict the associations between objects and relationships with types and subtypes. Diagrams should illustrate the attributes of each object, their individual behaviors, and restrictions on each class or object. So we're going to see how that looks in a minute. And um, look for and seek the actors. Who are the people using it? The physical objects, the places, the organizations, the records, the transactions, collections of things, operations, procedures, and things manipulated on the system to be built. So. Here's a drawing of it. So we have the customer. The customer is looking for fuel services, parking services, or maintenance services. So it really is a filling station, which also does parking and maintenance. Um, the customer may also want to look in, well, because of what the customer is trying to do, it, it's going to affect the control of inventory. Accounting services, we've got to charge the customer and see when they pay. And building services. Services are going to have to look at time to see when bills are due and set those up. So from the inventory, we're going to want a parts ordering system so that we can refill inventory. A fuel ordering system so we can refill our, our tanks. Accounting services has got to go through a printer system if we're going to send out bills. Today we probably also have it update a uh, web accessible database, right, for people who want to pay online. Billing services might go to the credit card system because our customers may be using credit cards. Okay. So that's kind of a generalized but uh, requirements based view. So what about the class diagram? What does it do? It, it tells us what needs to be processed, what items have multiple attributes, when do we have more object, more than one object in a class, what's based on the requirements themselves, not derived from understanding of the requirements. So um, we're really looking at what are the requirements themselves, whether we fully understand them or not yet, we've got to put in what are the requirements. And what attributes and operations are always applicable to a class or object. So like this. We may have attributes, personal checks, taxes, price, cash, credit cards, discounts. Or we could have classes. We have a class of customers, we have a class for maintenance, services, fuel, bills, purchases, and the station manager. Why would we have station manager as a class? He has privileges. He has privileges, exactly. He may have different access to different things within that application. So we can further flesh it out. Um, we had personal check, tax price, cash, credit cards, discounts. Now we might want name, address, and birth date of the customers, right? We have birth date. How many of you get notified through email of special discounts at a restaurant or something? Yeah. Um, 
In the classes, we could expand that out. We've got customer maintenance services, parking, fuel, bill, purchase, maintenance reminders. You might want to remind a customer when they've had an oil change and we know their average driving. It might be time to come in, station manager. I get a lot of those. Okay, what are some of the guidelines for identifying behaviors? Well, we've got imperative verbs and passive verbs and actions, right? I have to go to the English teacher to understand what we're doing. Uh, we can have uh, behaviors based on whether something has a membership in some, a class, uh, whether it's a manager or o ownership of a class, responsible for that particular class and its data. Services provided by an organization would be an example. So, adding even more to our attributes, I think that side stayed the same. But now we've gone down and added uh, overdue bill letters, dormant account warnings, parts accounts, inventory, credit card system, part ordering system, and fuel ordering system. So the more you begin to build your application working with the customer, the more you find there are other things you need that you didn't think about. So now, let's put this in a UML form, and you see that we've got customer, and the attributes are name, address, and birth date. Uh, maintenance reminder is a, has some text in it, bill overdue has text, dormancy warning is text. What's dormancy warning? Haven't seen you in six months, would you like to come back and see us? I guess that's what um, accounts, we have account number, a balance, the dormant, um, dormant would be, is this an active account or not an active account? Notice it says boolean, one or zero. Suspended, reactivated, bill reminders, dormancy warning, and so forth. But notice that every time we have a class, we identify the attributes for that particular class. Now, as we go further, we make a second cut at it, it gets more complicated. But what's happening is, as we're thinking through the original one, we begin to see ways that maybe we can summarize some of it, maybe we'd simplify some of it. But this is just another cut with more detail from the first one. And it's where UML kind of helps you. Okay. And that's the final cut. Do you think it's going to be easier now to um, code a system with this kind of background? Yeah. You're knowing what's happening. Those are not exactly modules, but you can kind of see things happening there that you could begin to make into modules. <coughs> so you can kind of see how you can summarize this and look at it as smaller packages. You can have accounting, you can have transactions, messages, services, inventory. These could almost be modularized on their own, and they cover this part of it. And now we go back to the very first drawing, and you see where the customer is involved with the service station itself, 
where the credit card services come in, where we have purchasing and where we have refueling. Sometimes this would be called back office in our retail environment because customers don't deal with purchasing and refueling. This is the, the station itself purchasing stuff to come back in. Uh, the customer is really in this area all the way over to, they're not actually uh, processing the credit card information, but it is their credit card. Getting to a point where those boxes you see there could almost be modules. Now, what about a communication diagram? Well, it depicts the sequence of messages between objects. So the customer maybe is going to do some part, maybe he's interested in parking, he goes to the service station and then down to the parking. And um, at the service station level, it may go over to purchasing, which gives them a parking permit, which then allows them to go back to park. So you see some things that are happening. If it's a new purchase, you've got to set up an account, date, the parking and the duration. Okay. So that's all based on buying a parking spot or going into parking. So what about a state diagram? It shows the possible states an object can take. So, um, and the events that can trigger a change in state. Well, you notice that we've got an account in good standing but what can happen to it? Well, if it's active, and it's kind of hard to read this, but it can go dormant, can it? This is the uh, pay amount. What if it goes 90 days and the balance is equal to zero? One month balance equals zero. A balance is greater than zero. Is that greater than zero? Yeah. yeah, okay. 90 days and balance greater than zero. Then we want to say it's delinquent. Um, and we want to send a bill reminder. So we're going to change the state. When the bill is greater than zero? Sorry? When the bill is greater than zero, you say it's going to be... When the amount owed, when the amount owed is over 90 days and the balance is greater than zero. Yeah, think about that programming, don't you? When you check 90 days and it is zero, it's okay. Isn't it? It's interesting that they make the, the, on the condition there, if the balance is less than or equal to zero, then the account goes dormant. They don't really say what they're going to do with that credit balance. I know. Um, Keep quiet. <laughs> I guess they keep the money. <laughs> it goes into the owner's account. <laughs> I think that is quite common. Banks and credit card companies, I don't think, send back the money. Um, you have to. You have to. You have to ask, ask for it. For it. Yep. Well, when I found out. But that's not the case when it comes to health care. They have, do send it back? If you have a credit uh -huh. balance there, they'll send it back to you. My insurance company won't send me an uh, overpayment check. Really? Yeah. That's good. Why'd you make an overpayment? No, well, I mean, I went to the doctor and doctor, yeah. But, yeah, you pay the doctor and right. then the insurance pays them. Well, that's true. And then they refund you the, right. refund you the difference. And that's, that's a common situation. So anyway, I think this is probably a good place to stop. Because um, this is just going through the different UML uh, diagrams, okay? But uh, I think one of the things I want you to see here is there's a lot of flexibility in how you do this. But you want to do it with pictures because 
if somebody's going to come back and look at your documentation years from now to see what your modules do and how they interrelate, this kind of drawing helps a lot. Right? Also helps for you to explain to your manager or to the customer that you have a grasp of what the system is supposed to do. It also helps you to make PowerPoint slides for those meetings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, why don't you guys get together and uh, talk about where you are on the project. Bill's almost got it written. Yep, it's a verb. Yep. <laughs> okay. <coughs> what do you have? What do you have? What do you have? Um, okay, so last week we had indicated that there were, uh, let's see, I guess, excuse me if I mispronounce names. Umar? Yes. Yeah. Did I say that right? Yes. Umar? Okay. Um, you're doing the scope, so have you have you had a chance to write that up? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this project consists of designing a pizza order and delivery system for a new pizza shop. This shop doesn't have any restaurant dining, it's a kicker for delivery on the business. The project will be completed by December 5th, 2016. Okay. Um, my question now is uh, if I will need to uh, all the system payments, uh, I mean the menu. Well, that's going to be part. That'll be well. That those items will be listed as the requirements. Mm -hmm. So the the scope is a general, more general statement of what the entire system is supposed to do, and it might list some constraints such as. Um, the, like the, the hardware, the platform that you're, you're restricting it to. Uh, I believe last week we mentioned Analytics uh, server, base server, and we were also going to provide uh, both web, uh, web-based ordering as well as uh, POS. Yeah, POS, you know, portable devices. So those cannot be part of the scope, right? Pardon? It cannot be. No, that can be part of the scope, you know, because you, you set your constraints uh, so that, you know, you, you don't go, uh, you know exactly what it is you're building. And that's, I mean, you don't have to be very specific, but in the terms that I just stated, that, that the, the system is to provide a web-based uh, ordering system as well as a portable device to access as well. And, then it's a matter of, of what we do within those constraints that goes down into like the requirements and the, and the rest of the system design. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, okay, the second thing was team organization. Yes, two seconds. Pardon? Two seconds. Two seconds. Time's up. Right. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. No, actually, you have perfect timing. <laughs> I, this report is a bit, right. and it can be reformatted, it can be changed, and the chart probably needs to be made a little bit bigger. Uh, you need to add Wasabi to it, because he's at, he's joined our group. Oh, okay, I'm joining the group. Yeah. Okay. I'm joining the group, guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> what is his name? Wasabi. So, yeah, he's moving up from the Sanjay. John McKinney. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Uma. And Bill. Bill takes, Bill takes the meeting minutes and posts them every week. Um, and I would like to you guys to give me what way you have so that I can what I need to contribute. Yeah, yeah, well I'll get there. Okay. Um, I was just kind of reviewing what it is that we 
have we have a date, uh, our first due date of of anything to be submitted is Wednesday, September 28th, and the and the first three things uh, that have to be submitted is the scope, the team organization, and then the data management plan. Uh, I don't see. She's not here. She's not here today. But uh, I have a few things. You know, remember what's here? Yeah, yeah. You, so the go. book talks about four steps. Uh -huh. I was thinking of breaking it down a little, a little further so, you know, we can have, uh, you know, sort of tasks. Okay. Uh, so I say, you know, first thing, the list would be uh, types of data. But all of these, um, I have to start after the design. Uh, um, this computer or some sort of other halfway. Okay. When I know the, the uh, specifics of the requirements. Okay. So I have also looked at, I started one, you know, looked at, looked at different sample of uh, data management. They call DMP pretty much you know, all everywhere. Mm -hmm. And these are the items I found that in common in different samples. Uh, one could be uh, data types, and then uh, the data and metadata structure, defining uh, the metadata details of the data, you know, what kind, how, and all that. Mm -hmm. And then there would be uh, data access, slash legal, you know, things you can do with data, things you can, some policies, okay. with, uh, written uh, structure of how, the policies of how the data will be accessed, and how will be uh, sort of uh, safeguard the data. Okay. Uh, then, uh, again, reuse and redistribution. And then uh, storage and backup, there'll be another one, and quality assurance. These are the, uh, Breakdown of all the, the four steps that that are in the book. That are in the book. Okay. Also, I have um, there are some other other uh, places where I found some outlines. They when they are writing it, the outlines they use intro, which would be sort of similar to what scope uh, mm -hmm. he, uh, he was talking about, and then roles and responsibilities, the expected data, what kind of data will be getting, and then uh, period of data retention, data format data storage and preservation of access, and again, uh, policies. Okay. So these, uh, we can, I'll wait till I hear from Carolina, and then once we have the specific requirements, we can restructure this, okay. and actually write it down step by step. As, as since the due date mm -hmm. is two weeks from tonight, right? Um, it would be great if everyone uh, can have their you know, have a, a, a rough draft or more uh, available for the team to, to review. I would, it, it'd be nice if we could have it by uh, next Wednesday, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a week from tonight. Okay. That way, that way uh, somebody can put it all together into a final paper. Okay. What and, I can and, then the, and then bring that in on the 26th mm -hmm. for the team to review the final paper. Uh, before it gets turned in on the 28th. What do you think about these are just one number? The same so what I can do is I can, I can go through this, come up with the mm -hmm. final list, let's say, you know, six, seven, eight items, and then also start writing some uh, detail of it. Yeah. And then create a rough draft, post it on our discussion board that sounds for good. reference. Yep. Okay. No, that sounds good. Yeah, if, if you want to post stuff to the, to the discussion board sooner, that's, I mean, that's fine. I mean, okay. You don't have to wait till class with it. To do that, so if you can see that. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it might be actually better if you do that. Anyways, um, um, let me ask a suggestion. Uh -huh. We can have a, a Google Hangout that we can get, get some Google. Um, <laughs> what can I call it again? The like for collaboration. Yes. The collaboration. And I have some kind of the off hours like nine o'clock, eight o'clock. We can uh -huh. arrange to meet and talk. Then um, there, there might, there, we have some drive that we can share. Maybe a drive that you can put in scope that you don't. Someone else can work on it, then you can work. Then you can. Well, in the, uh, the, so the, the class has, the, the, class has board. the discussion board oh, okay. to do to do all so that, the D2L. Okay. You can do all of, uh, most of that in, in D2L where you can post stuff. Uh, 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 the rest of the team can read it. Yeah, yeah, just go. already start, started that since, so you should. Yeah, just we'll just that. go out to the team assignment air to the project team A discussion board, and there's also I mean as far as um, isn't there like a notebook feature in this? Notebook, I'm sorry. I thought there was like a. Uh, 
Collaborate Ultra. Yeah, there's all the, in here. There's a Collaborate Ultra, which I haven't tried that. I haven't tried but, that. Either. And then there's a locker where you can actually. I think that's where you can actually post things. Post things up yes. there. That that's limited to just your access your, or your your groups access. Actually, I'm not sure if it's just your access or your groups access. Yeah. John, that Collaborate Ultra yeah. is kind of like a multi-site uh, meeting. Okay. Using, it's kind of like Skype. Yeah, that's what he's, he was asking if we could do is, is, yeah. is do it. I think you can. So. so sort of set up a meeting and people can join in at yeah, the starting time? Yeah, we've got time. laptops with uh, cameras and stuff. Okay. You can actually join in. Okay. So, I mean, if you wanted to like schedule something like that with the team, just you know, try it, check it out, see how it works and stuff, and then um, you can put send a, send us all a email message saying, hey, let's let's try and you know get together on on whatever date and time um, you know you want to try it. Okay. Um, this looks good. The, I mean, it's got. This was the team organization, so which has structured tasks. Um, I just yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can change that. It's just a yeah. case if I set it to do it automatically. So, as far as I can fix that easily. Yeah, yeah. That's fixed now. <laughs> as far as like a, a, we, we went through last week and kind of assigned everybody <coughs> else, based on um, what was what was uh, due coming up, and um, and then what was due the following week because the second assignment is due just a week later, which is the rest of the items on this list. Um, He's already done the team organization. He's working on the data plan. He's uh, refining the the scope. Um, he's gonna he's gonna be doing this the uh, schedule. Now, do you have that for the schedule? And uh, that includes the work breakdown structure and all that. You have. That in mind as well, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yes. I was looking at the Gantt chart first because that is the more technical, yeah. more difficult. Okay. Yeah, yeah, these other items just feed into the Gantt yeah. chart. So. Mm -hmm. You want me to join you with the walk around structure of my stones and Gantt chart? I'm sorry? You want me to join me? You want yeah. to join me with the. Oh, you want to join him with you, the. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Structure on my stone. Mm -hmm. Is that is that gonna be alright? Yep, yeah. yeah, that's fine. Um, I mean, yeah, any anytime you can get stuff together and put it together, the sooner is always better than later. Um, but it's not going to be required until yes, what is it, the we twenty. Need to, we need to put in something down so we, if there is any correction or anything yeah. that we need to work on more. Right. Based on the other group and uh, other team mm -hmm. experience or decisions, they can say, hey, you guys, you need to you need more of this. Right. They can spot it, then we can, before we run out of the time. Okay. And also, I, I was looking at the requirements list here. I mean, there, it's actually a lot of uh, diagrams and stuff as he was going over tonight in class. Mm -hmm. um, so, Based on that, it will change. I think the whole... I'll do. I'll, I'm going to write up what the the basic requirements are for the system, mm -hmm. but then I think as far as meeting all of these other require these other um, requirements for the requirements uh, <laughs> is uh, where I think we're going to need to split that up and, and each of us do some of those. But know, that's that's for the next phase, right? Yeah, that's okay. for the next phase. But that's you know 
give it to you so they will. Okay, so do I have any questions? So you have something to do now? Yes, I'll be okay. working with uh, okay. Yep. So what my understanding is whatever the data management firm can come up with, that will gradually change, you know, as soon as we... Yeah, more I mean, all of this can be refined right. as we, right. you know, put it all together. Okay. And it, am I correct, the, these uh, early turn-ins are really just kind of progress checks? Yes, because I'll look at them and make comments. Yeah, and then we'll revise them right. um, you, based on your comments or, or anything else that we or anything feel that needs to be added for the final paper, which should be turned in on, on uh, December 5th. Right. Yeah, right. Okay. Something in my resume. This is just the first half. Well, of you, yeah, you posted it? Okay. Okay. Oh, by the way. You, you, since you did that on the, on the meeting notes one, yes. can you change the resume one to the just TNA resume? No, that's what I was, I was thinking. You know, I think we should do that. Yeah. Because I'm just replying to his thread and I posted my own. Yeah. Can he change the title of this one? Yeah, he did. It says I made it, yes. All right, yeah. yeah. John, when you do things, also label them as Team A. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay. I haven't test, tested that in uh, four years, so I added that. There you go. Resume. Resume. All right. Yeah, we have, like, for the resume, we have the discussion thread being Team A resume. For the timesheets, it's Team A weekly timesheets. And for the uh, team meetings, it's Team A meeting notes. <laughs> do I have, to, like, the time that I spent to come up in a booth? The study and uh, uh, writing it down. I need to keep track of that. Oh yeah, yeah. I posted that. Okay. I'll download that. I'll download that. Yeah. Yeah. So that I saw you. Does does, does anyone have any questions about the timesheet? Okay. I actually totally somehow didn't see the bottom part of the discussion. Oh yeah. So yeah. So I I just named it this kind of generically, but if you as you post it, if you change this to be the date that you, mm -hmm. you're for the week ending date, um, you know, the month and day, and then also change um, what goes out here further, and actually I, I can show it down here in the downloads. Um, it's, I have member name, team okay. member name. So just rename so, that to? Yeah, just rename that to uh, you know, team member name mm -hmm. uh, to your to your name or the last name slide or whatever, uh, whatever you want to call yourself. But um, and then and then after you fill it out, I'm assuming this has Excel only. Yes. <clears throat> How often we post this? I'm supposed to do it weekly. Okay, so uh, on Sunday night. Yeah. Oh, this okay. That's fine. That would be good. Skips in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's fine. And I have a question. Is the timesheet? Yeah. Is it going to be done by one person or no, individual? No, it's, it's right here. There's a timesheet uh, thread out there so, uh, in the discussions. There's a form. This form is out there. Just download it. And that's what we're talking about right now is just download it and fill it out. So change, change the date here. To be whatever the weekend you day. Needs. Pardon? Oh, yeah. yeah, anytime you work on it, just put the, what a, a description of the activity you're doing and then record the time. And then once a week, uh, like on Sunday, uh, upload your form to the thread. So for each to, week, we'll have one file. Right? For yeah, each, each of you would have one no, file. For one week, we have one file. For next, next week, we have another file. Yeah. Okay, that's right. So, so we have to, to to the D2L thread. Um, so you go, yeah, to, to this thread. You just do a reply to the timesheet. Just do a reply and post your, you know, add your timesheet. Every week? Yeah. Is it going to be collected for everybody or just one? Everybody submits their own timesheet. 
So each individual person submits their own timesheet, and then the program manager, which is me, uh, <laughs> um, will tally all, the, all that up and for the weekly status report. Okay, that we have to also provide, have on hand for when he decides he wants to ask for it. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and all of all of those, the timesheets, all of the timesheets, all the status reports and stuff, all have to be attached to the final project. Mm -hmm. So they all have to be there. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Any questions or concerns or everybody know what they need to do? And can I keep this or do you have it? Yes. Did you put this already on, on uh, that? Yeah. 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 I can if you let me to. Yeah. Actually, we, um, how do we want to do that? Do we want to start another thread that um, for the project plan? Maybe these three deliverables, rules, we can just say, hey, deliverable one, scope, deliverable two, uh, organization, and deliverable three, uh, data management plan, then we can have to keep up with each other. Okay. Yeah, you tell me, you tell right. me how, whichever are, we can just say, hey. Uh, okay. We have added him, Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm sure I got the name right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, maybe yeah. we just have a, another thread for each of these. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, we won't have to go digging through right. replies right. and stuff to find it. Correct. Yeah. It'd be kind of nice if there was a shared sort of a folder, folder. Of things, right? Uh -huh. Is there is there in D two O is there a, like a shared folders sort of thing? Um, I think the only thing if you just use the. Um, the Dropbox, isn't that going to be... Oh, well, Dropbox, we have Dropbox, right? Where's, where's the Dropbox? I think it's under other. No. Uh, in some, in, the, in my other class, I have a Dropbox. Over here, I don't see a Dropbox. Does it have to be enabled by the professor? Yeah, I think you have to enable it. In my other class, I have a Dropbox. Right between these special discussions. Oh, uh, right in here. Uh, right. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know if you're One that will be, like, if anything. Some resources. Yeah, that's kind of informal. There you go. Yeah. Where did you put the? Um, where do we, oh yeah. do we want to put that in the threads? Where do we want to? Yeah, just create project? just create a thread called um, team organization. So Bill's going to create the other two threads too. Or, uh, yeah. So we're, we're going to basically we're we're going to have a thread for each of these. Okay. So. Actually, I can't create them because I have to have a, have to have content to put there. Oh, so the other people are going to have to create those. Oh, the others. The other ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's fine. Yeah. And then, and then they'll be responsible for, you know, the original updates of it. Okay. Give me just a moment. The new version of that will be posted. Excellent.